Welcome, everyone, to the final event in this year's McGill University Research Group on Constitutional Studies Lecture Series, a series that's been concerned to bring especially into the heart of student intellectual life at McGill attention to research into the values, institutions, principles, and foundations of a free society. It's a series that I was pleased to see developed into a series of inquiries around the thought that we don't know as much as we think we do about how ideas fit together, something that we saw beginning with Jeremy Waldron's rights-based critique of constitutionalism and judicial review, through Leif Winar's property rights-based critique of international trade in natural resources as that is currently structured, and including John Tomasi's free market-based defense of a theory of social justice. I think that some of the same slightly unexpected mixtures and slightly contrarian spirit will be in evidence today as well. I'm Jacob Levy. I'm coordinator of the research group on constitutional studies. Uh, and I'd like to begin with an acknowledgment of the generous donation to McGill from the Aurea Foundation that has made this lecture series possible. There's one other component of the gift from the Aurea Foundation that I want to mention to the undergraduates in the audience in case you haven't yet run across the information. There is an essay prize for the best substantial piece of academic writing by an arts undergraduate on the values, principles, institutions, and foundations of a free society. Uh, that's to encourage you among other things, to explore the idea of doing a substantial piece of writing on ideas that you've encountered over the course of the lecture series, though the subject matter will be construed broadly. Uh, those essays are due April 22nd. And if you haven't seen an announcement about it, send me an email, and I will send you the fuller details. This is the final event in the RGCS lecture series as such. There's one more RGCS co-sponsored event coming up next week to finish out the academic year that I want to mention briefly. And that's that the annual meeting of the International Foucault Circle will be meeting at McGill uh, with sessions in the Red Path Museum next Friday and Saturday. And with that, we will turn to today's event. Um, the first that is structured as a kind of debate, though I think that we will see some conversation that isn't quite characterizable as debate before that, uh, on the question, where are the moral limits of markets? And we're honored to welcome um, two very distinguished political philosophers to the conversation today. And I will introduce them briefly in the order in which they are going to speak. Matt Zwolinski is Associate Professor of Philosophy and co-director of the Institute for Law and Philosophy at the University of San Diego. He's the author of Arguing About Political Philosophy. He is currently writing a book entitled Exploitation, Capitalism, and the State, as well as currently co-authoring a book with one of our earlier speakers from the year, John Tomasi, called A Brief History of Libertarianism. He is, among his other efforts at public intellectual outreach, the founder and prime mover behind the academic political philosophy group weblog, Bleeding Heart Libertarians. Deborah Sapps is Marta Sutton Weeks Professor of Ethics in Society in the Department of Philosophy and by courtesy in the Departments of Political Science uh, and the Program on Global Justice at Stanford University, where she also serves as Director of the McCoy Family Center for Ethics in Society and as Senior Associate Dean for the Humanities and Arts in the School of Humanities and Sciences. She is the author of the important recent book, Why Some Things Should Not Be for Sale, The Limits of Markets, published by Oxford in 2010, as well as an eminent string of articles in the leading journals in the discipline. She has been Associate Editor of Ethics, an Associate Editor of Politics, Philosophy, and Economics, has served as Vice President, and currently serves as President of the American Society for Political and Legal Philosophy, the association that publishes the series Nomos. 
They will speak in turn for 20 minutes each, and then for 10 more minutes each in engagement with the other's presentation. And with that, Professor Zulinski. Thank you, uh, Jacob, and, and thank you, all of you, for, uh, for coming here tonight to, uh, to listen to this uh, and uh, to partake in the conversation, I hope, uh, afterwards. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here, an honor to um, be debating this important topic with, uh, with Deborah Satz. Um, so as Jacob said, uh, the topic for our debate tonight is the moral limits of markets. Uh, and in that debate, I suppose, my role is to play the champion uh, of markets, uh, or at least the more of a champion than Deborah is, um, as it were. Uh, Deborah, of course, has a, has a very thoughtful uh, and very nuanced position on this topic uh, that she's set out at great length in, uh, in an excellent book. Um, and if the title of that book, Why Something Should Not Be for Sale, is an accurate indication of her thesis, I think it is, um, then I think in some ways we're hardly in opposition at all. Now, after all, the claim that everything should be for sale is not one that I would want to defend and, and not one that I think uh, many in the classical liberal tradition would want to defend. Uh, I don't think that human beings should be bought or sold, nor do I think that votes in a democracy should be bought or sold, nor grades in a classroom. So the title of this debate, I think, is appropriate. It is a debate about where the limits of markets are. It is a debate about which things should not be bought or sold and why, not whether there are any. For that, I think, I have something on which we are both in agreement. So such a defense of markets as I will provide tonight uh, will, I hope, be as nuanced and as balanced as Deborah's thoughtful critique. But before I begin that defense, I want to make one important clarification about just what it is precisely that I am here to defend. For although our debate is about the moral limits of markets, I want to make clear that what I support are not markets per se, but rather voluntary, cooperative social arrangements. Now, markets can be one form of voluntary, cooperative social arrangement, and when and to the extent that they are, I'm in favor of them for reasons that I will articulate a little later in this talk. But not every voluntary cooperative social arrangement is a market, and not every market is a voluntary cooperative social arrangement. So I want to take those points in turn and expand upon them. So first, not every voluntary cooperative social arrangement is a market. So Carl Polanyi famously described a market society as one in which, quote, instead of the economy being embedded in social relations, social relations are embedded in the economy, end quote. Now, as a definition, that's a little unclear, but the general idea, I take it, is that a market society is one in which market norms, market institutions, and market values dominate and shape all other norms, institutions, and values. And if that's what a market society is, then that's not the kind of society that I advocate. And it is, I think, arguably, not the kind of society that those in the main line of the libertarian and classical liberal tradition have advocated. One certainly doesn't find it, for instance, in Adam Smith, for whom, like Deborah, I have a great deal of admiration and to whom I owe a great intellectual debt. And one certainly doesn't find it in Friedrich Hayek, who is explicit in distinguishing the kind of morally, morality appropriate to close personal relations and that appropriate to the larger and more anonymous, what he called extended order. I don't even think one finds it in the more contemporary and extreme forms of libertarianism, but that's somewhat a longer story. The classical, the classical liberal appreciation of markets in both its truly classic and contemporary forms balances, I think, its appreciation of markets with a recognition of the vital role played by families neighborhoods, and the various mediating institutions of civil society. So when we argue as classical liberals, for instance, that state provision is often unnecessary for the production of public goods in the economic sense, it is to the work of Robert Ellickson that we turn with its stress on the importance of unwritten social norms over written legislation. 
or to the work of Jane Jacobs on neighborhoods or Eleanor Ostrom on the tragedy of the commons and the ability of small private associations to overcome that tragedy. And when we stress the importance of market values, it is largely because and to the extent that we see those market values as supportive of some of our most important non-market values and perhaps also dependent on those non-market values for their effective functioning. So while markets can be an important form of voluntary cooperative arrangement, they're far from the only such form. And a world with markets and nothing else would hardly be a world in which I or anyone else I think on my side of this debate would wish to live. But as important as this point is, the second point I think is even more crucial for the purposes of tonight's debate. And that point is that not only is not every voluntary cooperative arrangement a market, it is also the case that not every market is a voluntary cooperative social arrangement. And I mean by this something more than what I think is the somewhat obvious point that markets are based on property rights and those property rights are coercively enforced and so in some sense markets aren't fully voluntary all the way down. That's true, but I mean to say something more. I mean that many markets are political constructions that have been rigged in ways that significantly limit people's freedom in order to serve some social or political purpose. Now I think examples of this phenomenon are common enough that I could easily spend the remainder of our time together tonight simply enumerating them. But for purposes of illustration, I want to focus for now just on the market for labor. Now, it is an interesting academic question whether a genuinely free market in labor would be morally justifiable or whether some regulation might be necessary to counteract problems of weak agency, vulnerability, and the like. But while this question is of great academic interest, it is important to recognize and to emphasize that this is not the question we face when evaluating our own labor markets. For labor markets as they exist today, and I speak mostly of the United States because that's what I'm familiar with, but I think what I say there generalizes. Labor markets as they exist today are not free, but rigged, and rigged in a way that systematically disadvantages some of the most vulnerable segments of the laboring class. Consider, for an example, regulations pertaining to organized labor. Conservatives in the United States like to complain about the ways in which the state supports unions at the expense of management and capital. And conservatives have a few instances that they can point to to support this claim. But in doing so, I believe, they ignore the overwhelming degree to which the labor market has been rigged in precisely the opposite direction. Historically, we can see this by looking at the ways in which two of the most important pieces of labor legislation in the United States, the Taft-Hartley Act and the Wagner Act, deprived unions of some of their most potent weapons by placing restrictions on sympathy, boycott, and wildcat strikes, imposing mandatory cooling off periods, and otherwise hindering unions' powers by forcing them to work through the official channels in which management had a comparative advantage, U.S. labor regulations served to create stability within the workplace and thereby to secure and entrench management's control of production. I think we can see the same thing on a contemporary level, right, by looking at right-to-work legislation, which is not an uh, a defense of the free market or enshrinement of the free market, but in fact a violation of the most basic free market principles of freedom of contract between laborers and employers. Or to turn to another example, consider minimum wage laws, which purport to tip the scale in favor of workers as a class, but in reality advantage certain segments of the labor market over other, and I would argue more vulnerable segments, and which were in fact advocated in the early part of the 20th century by many for precisely this reason. If employers were hiring blacks instead of whites because blacks were willing to work cheap, then one way to solve this alleged social problem was simply to make working cheap illegal. Finally, as one final example, to anticipate an issue that I think Deborah and I will be talking about in somewhat more detail later on, let's look at child labor. Now, 
Again, whatever else one might think about the morality of child labor or the proper policy response to it, it is, I think, vital to stress that in most instances today, child labor is not pro the product, or at least not solely the product, of unfettered markets. The persistence, and in some cases the rise, of child labor is often a product of policies of enclosure, through which rural families were forced away from subsistence farming and into the cities where factory work became their only viable means of survival. It is exacerbated by protectionist policies that block the world's poor from access to many of the world's wealthiest markets and deprive them of the benefits of comparative advantage, trade, and specialization. And it is exacerbated by various and sundry restrictions on freedom of association, freedom of movement, and freedom of low-level entrepreneurial activity. Now, in all of these cases, it is, I think, an open question what we should think or what we should do about these unjustly rigged markets. Ideally, of course, we might wish to undo the rigging. But if that option is not politically feasible, and it often, I think, is not, rigged markets might still be defensible in some less than ideal sense, in that allowing workers to participate in them, as unjust as they are, might still be significantly better for those workers than attempting to block them altogether, or even in some cases, attempting to regulate them. This is a point, I think, on which Deborah and I are in agreement, at least in principle, though I expect when it comes to the details, we will find some, uh, some room for disagreement. Deborah and I are also, I think, in agreement about the moral virtues that markets exhibit when they are functioning at their best. Indeed, I can hardly hope to do better on that score than the account she provides in the first chapter of her book, uh, which I recommend to all of you. But as a partial and incomplete account of those virtues, uh, let me provide the following list. So number one, the rights of property and contract that constitute markets carve out for individuals a private sphere delegating to those individuals a jurisdiction in which their own decisions are determinative and they need not seek the permission of any lord, chief, or bureaucrat before deciding how to allocate their time and resources. This decentralized decision-making power allows individuals to make effective use of local knowledge it serves the goal of liberal neutrality by allowing individuals to act on their own particular conception of the good, secular or religious, no matter how idiosyncratic or socially disfavored it may be. And it provides both a refuge in which socially oppressed or disfavored groups, such as women and ethnic and religious minorities, can escape the demands of conformity and submission of the larger society, and, I think, an incentive for that larger society to treat them at equals, at least or at first, on the floor of the marketplace. Second, market institutions encourage and provide opportunities for individuals to interact in positive sum transactions. Now that makes people better off in material terms, and that's an important point. But more than that, it changes the way that individuals regard each other. It makes them regard each other not as threats to be destroyed or suppressed, but as potential allies, as trading partners, and as sources of wealth. It is therefore no accident, I think, that classical liberalism has long been the philosophy not only of free trade, but of free migration, and peace. Third, markets, as Deidre McCloskey has shown in much of her recent work, encourage at least a kind of virtue, and not merely the characteristically homo economicus virtue of prudence, though that's true, but the virtues of honesty, of responsibility, and of a kind of broad-minded humanitarianism. Markets do not just make us wealthier, they make us, in some respects, better people. And finally, but not least importantly, 
markets encourage economic growth. By coordinating the actions of a multitude of individuals through the price system and providing strong incentives to channel resources towards their most highly valued use, markets make us wealthier. And wealthier societies can afford not just more gold-plated faucets, not just more varieties of cereal on the grocery store aisle. They can afford more support for the indigent, more protection for the environment, more leisure time for those at the beginning and ending stages of life, more art, more philosophy, and more chances to seek refuge from the pressures that market society itself gives rise to. <clears throat> now, as I said, Deborah recognizes almost all of these points herself. But still, she thinks markets have their limits. And of course, she's right. Morality is complex, and there's no reason to think a priori that markets will satisfy every moral value we hold dear. And a posteriori, when we actually look at particular markets to see how well they do, it's not hard to find examples of where things seem to go wrong. And so it seems perfectly reasonable to conclude as Deborah does, though these are not her words, that markets are best thought of as a kind of tool. They can be useful in some circumstances for helping us do what we want to do, be it creating wealth or promoting a society of equals. But like any tool, markets aren't right for every job. So sometimes we need to tweak them, sometimes we need to constrain them, and sometimes we need to disregard them altogether. Now, I have mixed feelings about this, and it's with those feelings that I want to end my remarks for now. On the one hand, I think this idea makes perfect sense at the level of ethical theory and of political philosophy. One of the most admirable features, I think, of Deborah's work is its sensitivity to plural and competing values. So what you get from her work is not some neat and tidy principle, no simple algorithm by which all our political problems can be solved. What you get is a subtle, multifaceted, nuanced account of political morality. And like I said, at the level of ethical or political theory, that's great. But, I mean, there's but coming, right? <laughs> but, but, when we begin to think about applying that perspective at the level of practical politics, then I begin to get a little worried. It's one thing to talk in the abstract about markets being a tool that can work well for certain purposes and not for others. It's quite another thing to start thinking about who the actual people are who are going to be using that tool or who is going to be deciding, and on what grounds, when the tool is inadequate for the job, and how it is to be tweaked and tinkered with in order to be made to work right. When philosophers like Deborah talk about markets as tools, I feel fairly comfortable knowing that the aim to which they envision the tool being put is one that I will find admirable, justice, equity, the common good. When legislators talk that way, I start to get a little uneasy. And this, I think, points to one of the chief weaknesses in Deborah's approach. Her approach is focused on a moral evaluation of markets. And she acknowledges, at least, that the evaluation must always be made in the light of the available alternatives. So the question is not, are markets good or bad? The question is, are markets better or worse than regulation or socialization or what have you? But still, in the actual course of her arguments, she relegates this question mostly to the background. She doesn't, I think, engage with it in the same serious and thoroughgoing way that she engages with questions about the morality of markets themselves. And so no mention is made in the book, as far as I can tell, of figures like James Buchanan or Gordon Tullock, or indeed the entire school of public choice economics. And so while Deborah makes a convincing case that, for instance, there's no reason to think that markets will supply the appropriate level of education to all persons. There's no real effort to be made, made to ask whether there's any reason to think that governments will do so. And that question, I think, is a game changer. Because any serious or theoretical, ser any serious theoretical or empirical investigation of the incentives and behavior of government agents will reveal a whole host of ways in which they fall short of the theoretical ideal. Do market agents have imperfect information? Did any member of Congress actually read the bill they voted on last week? Do market actors generate negative externalities? Well, almost every cost a legislator generates is externalized. Do market agents sometimes put their own personal profit ahead of the public good? You get the picture. 
So Deborah is absolutely right to note that morality is complex. The question, as I see it, though, is do we really want legislators grappling with that complexity and using their very wide powers of discretion to resolve it, or do we wish to constrain that discretion by relatively clear, relatively simple, relatively transparent rules of the sort of prop rules of property and contract that define the liberal market order? And uh, I'm running low on time, so I'll simply suggest to you um, that uh, perhaps we don't. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, um, and thanks to Matt um, for both his uh, remarks and also for undertaking, I think, with along with a, a number of other people, a pretty stimulating research program, which is to show the ways in which libertarianism can be reconciled with um, aspects of distributive justice. So I applaud the research program, although I disagree <laughs> with uh, a lot of the, um, the arguments. So let's start with where we agree. Classical liberals like Matt and egalitarian liberals like me share some common commitments, and I'll start with five. First, we're committed to the idea that all citizens should have certain basic and equal rights, freedoms, and opportunities. Second, we think these basic rights, liberties, and opportunities have a kind of priority over other interests that people might want to pursue. Third, we accept a contractualist form of justification that entails that political principles should be endorsed by all who live under them, including those who fare worst if those principles are adopted. Fourth, we think that people should be able to freely exercise their talents and their abilities, and that the economy is an important domain where this happens. And fifth, we understand that people who are free to exercise their talents and abilities will wind up in different places in the social system. We therefore believe that some inequalities between people are inevitable. But we disagree about the implications of these commitments for the regulation of the market. Egalitarian liberals think they're powerful justifications for market regulation that don't run afoul of respecting people's equal basic rights, opportunities, and liber liberties. In fact, we think that ensuring these provides us with a powerful moral case for market regulation. In short, market regulation is not an assault on people's dignity and freedom, as some classical liberals and libertarians often claim. It's a condition for it. And that's what I hope um, to show you. And I think there'll be some overlap with some of the things that Matt said. But you'll see, I think, as I look at some cases where we draw very different implications about, those, um, uh, about the, the ways in which markets undermine our basic opportunities, freedoms, and rights. So I want to start with a case, because we're going to be talking about two cases um, in our discussion. I'm going to start with child labor which I think is an interesting case um, to think about, and I'll have a somewhat different, uh, and I'll, I'll respond to what Matt said um, in my 10-minute rebuttal. But um, <laughs> according to the ILO, the number of children engaged in child labor today is estimated about 246 million, and the majority of these working children are found in today's poor countries, although they're also re-emerging as a problem in developed parts of the world. Poor people around the globe put their children to work to earn subsistence for their family, and small business owners are happy to employ them. So we have a case, willing seller, <coughs> willing buyer, what's wrong? I'll start with a feature of child labor that I think Matt would agree is problematic. First, while he and I agree that the economy is a domain of human choice and decision, Children, especially young children, can't be considered full agents. We might celebrate homo economicus, but there is no infans economicus responding to market signals. Most children are put to work by their parents. And not only are children not the agents transacting their labor on the market, 
But even if their parents are well-meaning, they may lack information about the true costs of putting their children to work instead of sending them to school. What I elsewhere refer to as weak agency <laughs> is a feature of markets that provides a rationale for market regulation and which is compatible with sh uh, respecting the commitments that Matt and I share. Now for a second feature of child labor that brings us somewhat closer um, to the source of our disagreement. Egalitarians believe that certain resources are needed to make our rights, opportunities, and liberties more than empty slogans. Some classical liberals believe this as well, and I think Matt probably shares this idea. For example, Hayek endorsed a guaranteed level of provision for all citizens. Now, to my mind, that's a huge concession from the way that libertarianism is often understood and one I endorse. But this commitment to a baseline of resources casts a shadow on choices that are made in the absence of those entitled provisions. To put the point sharply, the fact that people agree to something as their best option doesn't fully serve to legitimate their choice. The fact that I choose to hand my money over to a gunman rather than forfeit my life doesn't legitimate that choice if I was entitled not to be in that circumstance. And that pushes us back then to always ask, when we're thinking about the market as a, um, a domain of choice, about the underlying entitlements on which market exchange takes place. All citizens need certain resources to make use of their basic liberties, rights, and freedoms. And liberal societies generally agree that education is one such resource. In most of its forms, child labor deprives children from access to education. This deprivation is harmful, and avoiding that harm provides another reason to regulate or ban child labor. Child labor is also harmful to society. It cramps the productivity of labor, it undermines health, and it props up a world of civility and humiliation, not a world of freedom. One point about labor markets, and I'll come back to that in my response to Matt later, is that labor markets have a particular shaping um, uh, ability to shape people who engage in them in various ways. And child labor shapes the uh, children to be subservient in various kinds of ways. Law and social policy have powerful roles to play in protecting citizens from these harms. And although some people think that poverty um, is, uh, makes uh, these laws impossible to realize. I'll just point out that child labor was banned in parts of Europe as early as 1284. Okay, so a third feature of child labor brings out a core difference between libertarians and li liberal egalitarians. Child labor, like other market practices, like many other market practices, generates third-party effects on the freedoms and opportunities of other people. Here's why. A society that allows child laborers lowers the price of adult labor. This is simply an effect of supply and demand. When that happens, this has the consequence that other families now have less real ability to keep their children out of work. A family that cannot support itself on the wages of adults cannot afford to forgo the additional income provided by child labor. But if a ban on child labor is enforced, the unfulfilled demand for labor caused by this will sometimes, perhaps often, push adult wages up or give employers incentives to develop the productivity of labor and families won't have to put their children to work. Their freedom and opportunities and their children's freedom and opportunities will be enhanced. This argument applies to many other cases of labor market regulation. Consider the limitation on the length of the working day, something that classical liberals tend to oppose. If an employer wants a worker to work for 14 hours and a worker is willing to work that many hours, they'll argue that it's incompatible with respecting the basic freedom of these willing contractors to interfere. It's a case of the nanny state. Notice, however, that one reason that workers may want to work so many hours is if the hourly wage rate is low. Reasons of subsistence could drive them to work hard. A statutory limit on the working day can, by limiting labor supply, push up the hourly wage rate, and people who would not want to work so many hours can now afford not to. 
whose freedom should prevail, the person who wants to work 14 hours or the person that doesn't? I don't think the answer can be derived from a philosophical commitment to liberty by itself. Markets have conflicting effects on people's liberties. Indeed, the widespread prevalence of such third-party effects makes economic liberties, or liberties in a market, different in character from other kinds of important liberties. In most cases, the exercise of my religious freedom doesn't narrow the scope of your religious freedom or inflict harm on you. Freedoms exercised in the marketplace are different. One person's freedom can, if widespread, have harmful effects on others, as the example of child labor demonstrates. My point here is that when there are large numbers of people involved in a market, whatever regulations we choose, someone's ox will be gored. Whose ox should we gore? What kinds of market regulations should we impose? For egalitarian liberals, the answer will largely depend on the best way to secure the basic freedoms, opportunities, and rights of the least well-off, to make these things not mere words. It matters whether a ban on child labor sends children into worse situations, like um, child uh, military uh, service or child prostitution, or drives up adult wages and thereby eliminates the need for child labor. But the egalitarian answer will also be guided by the idea that all of us have a claim to more equal opportunities, equal resources, and equal rights than our society currently provides. Egalitarian liberals believe in the importance of fairness in the competition for goods like jobs and political influence. Roughly, we think that people who are similarly talented and motivated should face equal life prospects. Although there are limits to the principle of equal opportunity, what to do with the big tails, how to reconcile it with other values, and although we recognize that this value will not be perfectly realized, it's critically important. Its underlying image of a fair race where the runners compete on equal terms is central to a liberal society in which birth is not destiny. Achieving this value requires that resources like income and wealth, education, access to political influence and health care be distributed more equally than they are now and than classical liberals would usually like. Moreover, and here is, a, I think, not just a philosophic difference, but a difference of temperament <laughs> and, and a, some empirical differences, we egalitarian liberals think it's perfectly appropriate and can work for the state to use its tax and spend powers and its regulatory powers in the service of this value, just as the state acts appropriately when it ensures as a backstop that people have the adequate resources to make use of their basic rights, freedoms, and opportunities so that these are not mere words. How am I doing? Yeah, ah, then I can do kidneys. OK. <laughs> All right, so now consider what's a harder case for me, a market in human organs. Should this little kidney come to market? <laughs> That's a complex case, which I discuss in my book in some detail. And just so you know, I don't advocate a particular policy in my book. But what I want to underscore is I don't think we can derive the answer to the question of whether or not to allow a market in organs simply from a commitment to basic liberties and or the insight that the economy is an important realm of human agency, whose ox is gored by different property regimes. Now, there are powerful arguments in favor of introducing such a market. In particular, there's a current shortage of organs for those who need them, and it's likely that allowing a market would increase supply. That's a welfare economics argument. There are also liberty considerations. We recognize a great deal of individual sovereignty over the body, and in fact, we already allow people to sell their blood, their hair, their eggs, and their sperm. So why not their kidneys? Well, as I say, I think there are some powerful considerations in favor of introducing such a market, but I have three reservations that parallel my arguments about child labor. So first, there's weak agency. It's hard to know the effects of giving up a kidney on one's future health and opportunities. To give you an extreme example, 
when my student Joe Shapiro conducted a study in Chennai of kidney cellars, he found that the majority of those he spoke to did not even know how many kidneys they had. That's a really case of an information failure. A study in JAMA in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that 79% of those in Chennai who had sold their kidney when it was briefly legal regretted having done so. So that means that if they'd known after the fact what they knew before, they wouldn't have done it, and we can talk more about why they regretted it. But again, it just shows you that there was weak information among the people who are transacting. Now, of course, if the weak agency argument holds, that's also an argument against allowing voluntary donations. So I just point this out, but it doesn't tell us whether we should allow a market. But second, as in the case of child labor, there are external third-party effects of allowing kidney markets on other people's choices. For example, the anthropologist Lawrence Cohn found that in the areas of India, where kidney selling was widespread, creditors placed additional pressure, pressures on those who owned the money. As Code notes, and this is a quote, in the Tamil countryside with its kidney belts, debt is primary, operable women are vehicles for debt collateral. Close quote. If kidney selling becomes, became widespread through India, a poor person who didn't want to sell her kidney might find it harder to obtain loans. Indeed, if the amount of available credit remained constant, the price for debt might change, yielding higher interest rates for those who are unwilling to offer their kidneys as collateral. If this is so, while allowing a market in kidneys expands a single individual's set of choices, if adopted in the aggregate, it might reduce or change the available choices open to others, and those others will be worse off. Again, whose ox should we gore? And third and finally is a concern about inequality. As I've said, liberals and classical liberals agree that certain resources are needed to secure the basic liberties, opportunities, and rights so that they're not mere words. If all goods were available only on the basis of ability to pay, then those who have not been economically successful will be excluded from the ability to exercise even minimal opportunities or liberties. But which resources should be provided? Some are obvious candidates, including not only education and a level of income, but also, although I cannot argue it here, health care. If access to some level of health care is needed as a condition on making our highest interests not mere words, should access to needed organs be conditional on one's ability to pay? Now, these concerns that I raise might be able to be dealt with through forms of market regulation. We can enforce informed consent laws, regulate the sale of debt, and have the state subsidize the organs of poor recipients, perhaps. My point here is only that we will need market regulation, and we will have to look empirically at the effects of different kinds of regimes to decide whether or not we should gore one side or the other. OK, I want to conclude by noting an irony. Egalitarians are often accused of being insufficiently appreciative of the accomplishments of capitalism. But I actually think it's the libertarians who come up short in this regard. In addition to raising incomes, one of the most important benefits of capitalism is the way it freed people from civility, from having to bow and scrape before their lordly superiors. And one of the ways it did this was through curtailing economic property rights. Capitalism did away with debtors' prisons, bonded labor arrangements, and it introduced bankruptcy laws. Capitalist markets don't give people the right to give up their ability to go bankrupt or to change employers, and they don't honor contracts in which someone accepts enslavement as a condition of getting a loan, even if some individuals would prefer this. My bank can't take my kidney or enslave me to pay off my housing mortgage. Egalitarian liberals celebrate these achievements of capitalism over its predecessor societies. Markets with their decentralizing functions and their impersonal nature have helped to erode personal subjection and servility. But politics and the state have also been important in securing the conditions of our basic freedoms. Think of the civil rights movement, 
the women's movement, and the New Deal in America. Unfortunately, too many of our fellows around the globe in our own countries still face conditions of servility and lack basic freedoms at work in their families and their societies. The market has much to contribute to further progress here, and Matt and I agree on this, but so does a lot of market regulation. Thank you. start that button yet. This is going to be hard enough. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot there. Um, let's start with an abstract point. So that applies, I think, both to cases of child labor and to cases of, of kidney markets. Sometimes people choose to accept offers that look quite awful to us. I think both child labor and kidney markets look like that. And the only reason they choose to accept those offers is because all their other alternatives are much, much worse, perhaps unjustly worse, perhaps worse because of things that we have done to them to make them worse or things that we have failed to do for them that we ought to have done. So the question then is, are choices made in such circumstances legitimated, uh, to use Deborah's phrase. And I think the question posed in that way cannot be answered because legitimated means too many different things. Um, in some senses, I think, yes, those choices are legitimated and others not, right? So are the choices legitimated in the sense of being a sort of full expression of the agent's autonomy? Well, no. Are they fully just in the sense of being uh, immune to any kind of moral or political criticism? No. So if that's what legitimated means, then those choices are not legitimate. But there's a narrower meaning that we could assign to the word legitimated, meaning simply that it is something with which we have good moral reason not to interfere. And I think in that sense, both the choices that people make in desperate circumstances in cases of child labor and in cases of kidney markets can, at least in principle, be legitimated. Why might we have good reason not to interfere with those choices? Well, and this is something that Deborah knows and elaborates upon in her book, often when we interfere in the choice of a person in a desperate situation, we end up making things worse for that person. So let me give you one example pertaining to the issue of child labor. In 1992, the United States Congress was considering legislation known as the Child Labor Deterrence Act. The purpose of this act was to prevent child labor by preventing the importation into the United States of any good made in whole or in part by children under the age of 15. Now, the act never actually received enough support to pass, but while it was being debated, employers in several countries where child labor was widespread took preemptive action in order to maintain their ability to export to the US's lucrative market. One of these employers was the garment industry in Bangladesh. And according to UNICEF's 1997 State of the World's Children Report, approximately 50,000 children were laid off in anticipation of the bill's passage. Most of those children had little education and few other opportunities to acquire one or to obtain alternative legal employment. And as a result, many of these children turned to street hustling, to stone crushing, and to prostitution, all of which the report notes are much more hazardous and exploitative than garment production. So one reason not to interfere with an individual's choice, even when that choice is made in desperate circumstances, even when that choice is made in unjust circumstances, is that doing so, if that's all we do, doesn't do any favors to the person to whom we are trying to help. There's a more general lesson here. Child labor is something that we often regard as objectionable. But child labor is, in most cases, a symptom of an underlying problem and not the underlying problem itself. The underlying problem is poverty. 
and bans on child labor by themselves do nothing to address this poverty. And so if all you do is take away a person's least bad option, you don't help them out. Now, I agree with, it, with Deborah that there are things we can do right, that go beyond mere bans on child labor to improve the situation of the world's poor. If we can take steps to increase the agency of the world's poor by providing them with information, or perhaps even by very carefully targeted regulation, that's good. One way, though, that I think we can increase agency that Deborah doesn't directly address is to increase wealth. We don't have child labor in the United States today, but that is arguably not a product, or at least not merely a product, of legislation that we have passed in the United States. It is the product of the fact that we can afford not to have child labor. And there have been uh, studies, there's a recent paper by uh, economists Hall and Leeson uh, that have looked at countries in the developing world where child labor is pre uh, prevalent today uh, and compared the level of wealth in those countries with the level of wealth uh, in the United States when we moved past child labor. Uh, and Hall and Leeson's estimate is that most of those countries are on average 35 to 100 years uh, away from being at the point where they are uh, at the same level of wealth as the United States when the United States moved past um, child labor. So one way in which we can increase child labor, or uh, sorry, increase the agency of individuals involved in child labor is to increase wealth, to give people more options so that they can afford to put child labor to the side as we have done. Uh, now on kidney sales, um, I agree with a lot of things that Deborah has to say here about the problems of kidney markets. I agree about problems of weak agency, although I think um, if we're looking at markets in which uh, kidney sales are outlawed and thus take place on the black market, um, I think we're going to find problems of weak agency to be especially prevalent there and that it might not be legitimate to generalize from those cases to what um, things would look like in a uh, above ground regulated uh, market. Um, but still, there are going to be problems with weak agency um, even outside of the black market. Um, there may be problems of external effects um, and, uh, and inequality as well. Um, I suppose that my difference with Deborah on this point simply comes down to uh, how we weigh the costs and the benefits. Uh, and to me, the fact that um, a lot of people are dying for want of a kidney uh, that they could probably have if kidney sales were legalized uh, carries an awful lot of weight. So uh, last data I had was that it was from 2008 in which 75,000 Americans uh, were on a wait list maintained by the United Network for Organ Sharing for a kidney. Uh, many of those individuals were receiving dialysis, uh, which, is a, which is a horrible process to go through. Um, if, you, if you are familiar with it or if you know anyone who's had to go through it, it not only utterly prevents you from living a normal life, uh, it also dramatically shortens your life expectancy in the case that you are lucky enough to eventually get a kidney transplant. It increases the progress of cardiovascular disease and so makes um, whatever transplant you get uh, much less effective. So the median survival rate for a new dialysis-dependent patient is 35% after five years uh, compared with 75% survival rate after transplantation. Uh, of two million... Uh, uh, well, sorry, let me, let me skip that for now. Um, so individuals are dying and suffering on dialysis while waiting for a kidney. And I think there's very good reason to believe that we could address that shortage, if not completely, then in great part uh, by allowing people to sell their kidneys, right? That the supply of kidneys would go up um, if the price that people were able to charge for their kidney uh, could go up. So there's a general point I want to make here in closing. Um, and the point is this, right? There are children who toil in sweatshops making our clothes, uh, our iPhones, and our toys. And we don't always see them, but we know in some sense that they're there. Uh, and because of our involvement with them, indirect though it may be, we feel a sense of moral responsibility towards them. By contrast, I think those individuals in the developing world who toil outside of sweatshops, those individuals who are scavenging for bits of scrap metal in the festering garbage dumps of Phnom Penh, for example, are almost completely unseen to us. Or even if we do see them, they do not bother our conscience in the same way. After all, we aren't buying what they're selling. 
They aren't in that dump working for us. So we don't feel as responsible for them. And we feel this, even if it is the case, that the restrictions we have urged to be placed on sweatshop and child labor are partly responsible for them being there, instead of in a relatively attractive factory job. Similarly, the individuals who sell their kidneys to the rich are visible to us. We feel a sense of collective guilt for the, uh, the suffering they undergo, because after all, we're using them in a way. We feel this even if we know that they are, all things considered, better off by virtue of our using them than they would be if we had not. By contrast, the people who die waiting for a kidney to show up do not touch our conscience in the same way because we have not used them in the same way. And so we don't feel as responsible for the harms that befall them, even if it is the case that the reason they're dying on a wait list is precisely because we do not allow a market in kidneys to emerge. So I think these considerations give us good reason to be a little hesitant to trust our moral intuitions in cases. It seems like our moral intuitions are biased in a way to take greater account of some forms of suffering than others, even if the kinds of sufferings that we are able to ignore are in the larger picture more serious and ones that we ought to be doing more to address. Okay. Um, so one of the points that I was trying to bring out is that the choices that are open to people is often endogenous to the background property rules and arrangements and laws. And that sometimes restricting an option can make more options available to people that they would prefer than would be the case to large numbers of people and particularly to the vulnerable. And so that's a question about how the restriction works. Of course, it matters how it works. But in the context of, for example, the restriction, some of the restrictions on labor markets have had an effect of driving up wages. Now, we may disagree. So we may have some empirical disagreements on who bears the you know, majority of the costs and how significant the costs are. Um, but that, that's an empirical disagreement, not a philosophical disagreement. I'm going to talk about our empirical disagreements in a second, but I just I want to disagree with something empirically, um, which is I don't think that it's poverty that ex fully explains why, ch why child labor prevails in so much of the world. And I recommend for anybody who's interested in this topic an old book on this by uh, Myron Wiener called Child and State in India in which he looks at the contempt that the poor and children are held in as one key factor in why there isn't more move to actually enforce. I mean, child labor is illegal in India, but it's not enforced. And the question is, why isn't it enforced? Why isn't anybody willing to take it up? And what he argues and tries to demonstrate is that elites have powerful reasons not to want to educate children, to educate labor, and so on. So that, that might be because they have weak agency, they don't understand what the benefits would be of doing this, but I think we can't take it as a, a given that it's poverty that's the explanation for some of our practices. I certainly agree it's an empirical issue as to whether or not by closing off options we improve options for other people. So I want to make two general points. I think there's some empirical differences between egalitarians and libertarians. I also think there's a philosophical difference, and it comes up a bit in um, Matt's remarks earlier. I think egalitarian liberals are much less skeptical about the capacity of the state to act to improve the well-being of people. Of course, there are examples, and I, I take some of your examples, where, this, where the state is an obstacle to freedom, where laws propped up um, subservience and exclusion um, and inequality. But when we act together, sometimes we make the world better. And there are lots of examples. And I always think about this. Um, there's a wonderful scene in a Monty Python movie where in Life of Brian, where um, they're arguing about what have the Romans ever did for us? And some of you will know this. And he says, well, they built the aqueducts. Oh, yeah, the aqueducts. Well, all right, what else have they done for us? Well, you know, they, you know, we, we have food and a vibrant economy. Oh, yeah, but what else have they done for us? So I actually think the state has done a lot for us. 
And so I don't have, although I recognize, of course, that there are you know, states that uh, can be captured by private interests, that um, the state has sometimes been an obstacle for uh, uh, you know, freedom and opportunity. I think the state has the capacity and has often acted to further those things. And that, I think, is a character, I have a characteristic optimism, I think, that the egalitarian liberal has to state action and a belief in the power of our acting together that really serves to separate us. So the, on a philosophical level and on an empirical level, I think we disagree about the power and prospects for state intervention to improve the lives of uh, the poor and, and really of, of, uh, to promote the general good. Um, I want to take up one point that didn't come up. Uh, you, you went over it very fast, but I think it's worth saying something about, which is the argument that markets make us virtuous. So I have some uh, questions. I think markets have complicated effects on uh, virtue. <laughs> But in particular, I just want to point out one important effect. Markets are radically individualizing. They let people exit. That's part of their power. But sometimes by letting people exit, you undermine a common way of looking at things. And for some problems, that's important. So to give you an example, which many of you may know, um, very famous uh, um, a, uh, experiment um, was done in Haifa looking at uh, daycare centers uh, where the parents came late to pick up their children. And the daycare center decided, well, here's an idea. We'll introduce a market, and people will have to pay for being late. And that will then bring about a better outcome for us. And the result of introducing the financial incentive was that parents came later, of course, because now they could buy something that previously they could get for free. So the daycares thought about this. And I'm oh, sorry, they could buy something that now they thought they were buying a service rather than doing something that was morally problematic. So the daycare sees this and decides that's really bad. They're coming later, and it's not worth it to us. Now, maybe they didn't charge enough. Maybe if they'd made it $1,000 a minute, the parents would have come on time. But the parents came. So they took away the fine. And the parents didn't change their behavior. So with six months later, they were still acting that way. There are a lot of um, economic experiments that look at uh, people's altruism and the degree of altruism in various, you know, there are stylized games. The dollar division game is one where you ask people um, to, to do you give people some money and you ask them to distribute it, and then there are various uh, ways that they can do this. And it turns out when economic incentives are introduced, people are less generous. Now, that doesn't mean that market societies are less generous than non-market societies. It's probably the reverse. But then you want to ask why, if it can be shown pretty robustly that markets have these effects, maybe they're a countervailing institutions and liberal societies that make people more generous. Um, many of you may know this interesting little fact. Uh, studying economics makes you less able to solve prisoner's dilemmas than if you study philosophy or sociology. So although markets have some important moral characteristics, and in, you know, individual exit is a very powerful tool in the battle against servility and for equality. And also, markets are important in societies that are heterogeneous, where you don't want agreement on everything. Markets also can undermine the possibility of common commitments. And so we have to be careful, I think, on the markets work both ways. And again, it's an empirical question as to how they work. Okay. <laughs> We now have time for questions and answers. And since the reception is immediately adjoining, I think that we'll take the liberty of running a little bit past 6 to keep the conversation going for a little while. Um, I'll ask questioners to go to the microphone. However, um, it is our custom here to reserve the first question for 
a member of the research group on constitutional studies student fellowship, if any of the student fellows would like to kick things off. Hi, thank you both very much for your talks. I'm wondering if I can repose the initial question in a new light, in that the way in which you've both construed limits seems to have been a question of legality. And I'm wondering whether or not we can conceive of the moral limits of a market in more regards than just what should the state allow or not allow, but rather what should a cultural value be of the market or an evaluation of the market, uh, non-state-based limitations on uh, of ways enforcing the morals on the markets. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a that's a very nice question, and um, I think I think it makes sense to talk about both sorts of limits, right? Legal legal rules are one sort of way that we uh, one sort of tool that we have available to us to um, shape uh, behaviors and and values in a society, but of course they're not the the only sort of tool. Uh, and I think there there is an important role for for social norms in limiting markets too. And I think um, it's precisely those kinds of social norms that the um, the study, the daycare study that you just uh, uh, pointed to, illustrates. Right? I mean, what was what was going on in that example was there there was a norm that you just don't show up late to pick up your kids because that's not fair. You're taking advantage of the poor daycare workers. And when that norm was replaced by the market mechanism, right? Um, the market mechanism didn't do as good a job as the norm did, right? So I think there's a place for norms like that. Um, I think, of course, there's, I mean, as I said, I, I tried to say in my in my opening remarks. I think there's all kinds of ways that I like to see the the market limited. Um, when I when I give my wife a gift for her anniversary, I don't just write her a fifty dollar check. Uh, even though, in some sense, that might be the most efficient gift because she could use that fifty dollars on whatever she wanted instead of whatever I happen to have picked out for her. Um, so that's that's a limit of of market logic and market values. But I think it's a it's a perfectly appropriate limit, and I think there's there's lots of that kind of thing. Um, so where's where's the questioner? Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> but yeah, I can't see you. Um, I think it's a you know a very interesting question. Could be taken in a lot of different directions. So one thing I do think about, and this is actually a point Adam Smith made. Adam Smith said it's really great um, that people are oriented to the market because it produces the wealth of nations because you get growth and growth is really important for the. Um, the collective, but actually to the person who only orients their life to the market, they will recognize when they're old that they wasted their life pursuing something that re wasn't really important. And I actually think there's something to be said. I think earlier I was mentioning, um, you know, Willie Lohman in Death of a Salesman, who spends his whole life chasing after what he a kind of success because he wants to end up big. And his life is tragic, partly because he doesn't um, recognize what's in front of him and what's really important. So I think that's a kind of moral um, uh, perspective we want people to have, is that there are more things in life that have meaning. Um, and there are more things you should think about, especially you students, in thinking about what you do with your lives besides um, what pays the most money. <clears throat> Surely, if we define morality as ethical principles and practices used to enhance and protect the social good, then as practiced today, markets must be judged as immoral if we consider all the environmental degradation that they cause, uh, the needless suffering and death of many species, including humans, and the possible destruction of our planet. Surely, although markets may serve valuable purposes, as unlimited as they are today, or as insufficiently unlimited as they are today, they're not a social good at all. They're a social bad. Now, I certainly can see an argument 
for the youth of markets that have been limited in more profound and moral ways, but certainly they're not that way now. And I'm surprised Deborah didn't advance that argument, which to me would be the, her most powerful argument. <laughs> uh, I'm going to um, uh, stand over here because the light is. Um, uh, so I think it's an excellent point about the limits of the market. I want to separate out this idea of markets as instruments, which Matt express some skepticism, but I tend to think of markets largely as instruments for achieving certain purposes. There might be ways in which using markets could help us um, with some of the environmental problems that we have. So there are debates about whether getting the price of carbon right and then um, putting that on a market would be making people pay for the costs of the carbon that they uh, emit would be a way of solving the problem, having a cap and then having a market to allocate it efficiently. So I don't think, and I'd also separate out, you know, some of the think drivers of um, climate problems are about increasing the productivity of labor, which you could sep I mean, markets are an important instrument for doing that, but you could have, you've had non-market societies uh, improve the productivity of labor, not as much as market societies do. But growth and the product, improving the productivity of labor have created some environmental problems. They might also har be harnessed in a different direction. So I take your point, but I think if you think of markets instrumentally, you could think they're not intrinsically related to the problem, although maybe because we keep going on and on. <laughs> um, we should be thinking more about steady state. And steady state, which is a really interesting idea from the classical political economists, isn't something we, that seems so compatible with a market society. Matt, I don't know if you want By the way, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I've read him, but Adam Smith himself suggested that when it came to social good, <laughs> there were exceptions necessary to be made such oh, as que questions of armies and firemen, etc. In other words, not everything is to be defined by the market, mm -hmm. whereas we've reached a position today where it seems to be they've become overwhelming in, in too many ways. Yeah, I would, I would, and I would agree with Smith uh, that there is a, a role for the state in the um, say, provision of public goods, of which you know, clean air and, and clean water are... I think, genuine examples. Um, I think the question of the effect on markets versus non-market societies on the environment is um, not entirely settled, right? I mean, I think that one of the things that um, increased wealth does for you is it, it gives you more ability to purchase goods that you, you might not have purchased at a lower level of wealth, right? So, I mean, people who are struggling for subsistence um, can't afford to pay much attention to the environment. They might not be able to do much damage to the environment either. Um, then again, they might, um, but it's it's not as high up on their list of priorities as it might be. Um, so with, with greater wealth comes greater ability to pursue um, philosophy, art, and, and a clean environment. Um, and also, I think, right, if you, if you look at the, the history of non-market societies, right, like, for instance, if you look at the history of the Soviet Union or of China in the 20th century on environmental matters, um, it's, not, it's not so good. So the question has to be, right, again, markets compared to what? Thank you. Okay. So um, in this examination of where the moral limits of markets might lie, uh, the debate has mostly taken place in terms of the costs and benefits uh, of the outcomes of intervening or not intervening. But uh, what of the inherent morality of some of the things we're debating interfering with, uh, specifically child labor? Um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe some things themselves might just be morally off the table full stop, in which case there ought to be mar market intervention even if it did yield better results. Um, I know that might not be very intuitively palatable, but I was wondering what you both thought of that. So um, I certainly think that there are reasons to put some things off the table, but I do think, so, and philosophic, and let's make a distinction between, we could think something is morally wrong, but 
we could have different uh, regulatory schemes because we think, although it's morally wrong, there's no way in the world we live in to um, get us, uh, there's no direct path to the enforcing the moral norm except through some uh, not perfectly just behavior. So that's an empirical question. I think sometimes, so take the case of child labor. Part of it depends on what you think the realistic options are. So in my uh, book, I talk a lot about this. So there's an expressive function to law that's important. And actually, sometimes the expressive function, just saying something is wrong, right, even if at the moment you can't um, enforce uh, or make uh, the conditions that produced it, the underlying conditions, go away, the expressive function sometimes transfers rights to people that change, you know, have a, have a important, open up an important path. We don't always know when that's gonna happen. But an example that Matt gave, I think there, if what's driving you to be against child labor is its harms to children, then you have to pay attention to what the effects are of enforcing a policy that bans child labor. And if the, you see that the effects of putting in place the policy are that the lives of children are worse, it doesn't mean you take off the ban, but it means you've got to then figure out, is there a way compatible with the ban to improve the conditions of these children? And that gets to what's the space of possible alternatives, what are the options that are open? There are big debates in the world of uh, economists who study child labor about what the real options are in some countries. Of course, we live in a world where the wealthy world could help a lot, and that should be part of what's on the table. I actually largely agree with that. I'm not sure I have a whole, a whole lot to add. So I'll... Thank you. Hello. OK, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a question about uh, what Deborah said about uh, you know, the things the state or the state's, the state's accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that we accomplish great things when we work together. But working together and having something provided by the state is a non sequitur, mm -hmm. primarily because the state is coercing people to quote unquote work together, which in any honest sense is not actually working together anymore. And so I'm wondering what you guys think on the role of private charity and the role of working together without coercion. Okay. Uh, wow. Um, so I, I think you're right that there's a non sequitur between not all forms of working together go through the state, and one can go through the state without working together. But I actually, in my examples, like the civil rights movement, I'm trying to give examples where people work together to take control of the state for important social uh, and egalitarian purposes. Private charity has all kinds of problems. Actually, I have a colleague who works a lot on this. Most private charity in the United States, which is the country I know the best, um, does not go to benefit the poor. And uh, so most private charity goes to religious organizations overwhelmingly, where that doesn't go to the poor, or it goes to things like the opera, which I think is very important, but the opera isn't um, the, you know, if you're thinking about private charity as a way to ensure a satisfactory minimum for all citizens, it, it, it can't accomplish what the state can accomplish through its regulatory powers. Of course, most state redistribution also uh, doesn't go to the poor either, right? So this is, <laughs> I mean, this, it, it, it cuts both ways. I mean, if you, look, if you look at the bulk of the federal budget and where redistributive um, funds go. They go, as, as my theory would predict it would go, uh, it goes to people who uh, and groups who are politically powerful and can, can influence the government to directing funds their way. Um, so, um, so, I mean, I, I, I like private charity. I mean, I think I mean, it does, I don't want to deny the empirical literature, right? It does have problems. I just mean to point out that state, um, the state has problems too. Um, and of course, I think, right, that I agree with Deborah that the, the state can be one way of working together, especially when state action ever, evolves kind of organically out of a, an underlying social movement. Um, but as, with your, as your question, I think, suggests, um, m maybe a bit more strongly than, I'm, than I would agree with, uh, it's certainly not the only way of, of working together. We can work together outside of the state. Um, and, I guess I see no reason to 
think that that always has to take the form of charity either, right? I mean, I think that um, you know, a lot of what we do in the realm of commerce is a form of working together. It's a kind of cooperation. It's actually a kind of, I think, spectacularly amazing kind of, uh, of cooperation when you think about all that it involves. Um, so, um, you know, if we tend to we tend to sort of impute to the idea of working together um, a necessarily altruistic motivation, um, right? Which is why we kind of rule out um, commerce because we think that commerce is governed uh, purely by self-interest. Um, but it's it's not, of course, true that commerce is governed purely by self-interest. And I think it's also not true that the the only kinds of important working to forms of working together are those that are that are motivated by by altruistic concerns. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, so this is a question about uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you questioned the claim about there's more responsibility when you're tied to or using someone. And I'm wondering how much sort of your brand of libertarianism or you think libertarianism in general should rely on the doing allowing distinction. Um, and specifically, I'm wondering because when you were, uh, your rhetoric did not say we should abandon that. In fact, you said we, we're responsible for not allowing the emergence of a child labor market. Or we, we do not allow a market on kidneys to emerge, right? So it seems to me you sort of still want to hold on to that uh, do not allow. And yet, you're, you also seem to be using the rhetoric of, you know, hey, you know, uh, you should realize what sort of suffering uh, you might be emerged in. And, and I can understand those two sort of things, but I'm wondering how you might reconcile that in, in your own head. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a, a good uh, and hard <laughs> question for me. Uh, I, I don't consider myself a, a consequentialist, right? So I'm not, I'm not ready to kind of flatly reject the distinction between doing and allowing and say that all that matters is whatever consequences emerge from your doing or not doing, whatever it might be. Um, but I'm not a deontologist either. Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I think of myself as a kind of pluralist. And I think that, um, you know, at least in cases where the kind of suffering that we allow is really, really serious, then um, it's going to take more than a philosophical distinction between doing and allowing to alleviate our responsibility in those cases, right? So I, d I think we, we can't just point to the fact that, look, we're, we're doing something with sweatshop workers, right? We're interacting, we're performing some kind of positive interact activity and interacting them with a way, and that's why we're responsible for them. Whereas all those people scavenging in the garbage dump, right, we're just allowing them to suffer and not doing anything. I don't think that's an adequate answer to the challenge um, that I'm trying to pose here, which is, you know, why not try to do more for people who seem to need our help more than the people who are already, right, have factory jobs and are doing better than the, the national average. I guess I'm going to try to ask you guys if it's possible that it's good that we can gore the ox, uh, as it were. Um, uh, Professor Satz, in a lot of your arguments, you mentioned that um, by not restricting markets, uh, forces get pushed in a certain way that make it hard for people to do this. So for instance, child labor, uh, someone who's willing to work 12 hours and such, uh, makes it more difficult for others available on the market. Uh, I want to ask if there's another end of that equation that's maybe uh, less recognized insofar as that there's something good about an employer's choice to be able to choose someone who's willing to work 12 hours and if this relates to equality of an opportunity in a certain way. Um, so like a hypothetical example might be if I have to choose between two heart surgeons and one maybe is marginally better in some significant way than the other but one has come from much worse beginnings and deserves in every way a political choice or an opportunity to be able to work as a heart surgeon. If we collectively as a society say that I must choose the heart surgeon that come from such beginnings that they uh, struggled and deserve in any sense of equality and justice to be my heart surgeon. Um, it seems fair and it seems like we're going the ox of someone who can take it the most, perhaps someone that comes from beginnings that are much better off. But if I wonder is there's not something else that society values about having good heart surgeons. Uh, if equality of opportunity works on the other end of the market in terms of having, for instance, a market of laborers or professionals or professors perhaps 
that regardless of their beginnings are just better professors. I mean, at some point I would hope to be a professor uh, and my situation would be much better if all the really other qualified professors were just voluntarily removed from the market for my opportunities. Uh, but I think collectively there's something that we would hesitate about that choice. As equal and as just as it might be to allow all the, the less well off, the people coming from very poor beginnings, to have the chance to be whatever they want to be in the market. Uh, there's something that says, no, it doesn't matter where you come from. We want a heart surgeon that can do the job no matter what. We want a professor that knows the difference between Adam Smith and whatever the Fraser Institute says or something like that. Um, <laughs> so is that, is that something you can identify? Can you call it merit? Is there some other word for it? Either of you could answer this, I suppose. But what's, what's that value expressed? In, and is that something that would counteract equality and justice and maybe say that if there's a virtue in hiring a good doctor, is there also a virtue in goring the ox, in being able to fire someone who, regardless of the background, doesn't, doesn't make the cut, as it were? Um, okay, so there are a lot of uh, piece, moving parts to your question. Is this on? So there are a lot of moving parts to your question. I'm just going to pick up one piece of it, which is the meritocratic piece, because the kind of equality of opportunity I was defending is meritocratic. It said that... Um, you know, egal liberal egalitarians think that people who are essentially similarly talented and able should have the same life chances. So what does that mean? Well, it means here's a rough idea at age 18, right? We should provide people with the resources so that with, a, with equal resources for, uh, let's say, the state should provide equal education to all kids. And then kids, because they're different and because they'll be differently motivated and some will have different talents and they'll um, be path dependents, at age 18, they'll wind up very different. And some of those kids will then compete for jobs and they won't get the jobs if they're not as good as the other kids who, the other 18-year-olds who do get, or the other 22-year-olds who get the jobs. So it's a meritocratic principle. It's not a principle that's, it's not e equality of outcome. It's equality of opportunity. It says that a democratic society, your social origin of your birth shouldn't determine what place you wind up with in the social structure. That's a meritocratic principle. If I may respond briefly, is uh, to question that distinction, if... Uh Okay, part. <laughs> I, I, I don't have uh, much much to say about this, I, though it occurs to me that there's probably one other philosophical area of difference between um, Deborah and I that maybe hasn't come out yet, and that is that um, while uh, while Deborah considers herself an egalitarian and places great weight on s some form of social equality. Uh, my own views are that what is what is really socially important is um, sufficiency rather than equality. So I think it's important that people have enough, in some sense, uh, of of social resources, not um, so much that they have the same as what other people have. Uh, obviously, that's would need fleshing out, but it's just a kind of general gesture at an area of, of disagreement. Hi, thank you all. Thank you both very much for the very congenial debate. I want to try to uh, get you to expand a little bit on something I think you disagree on. Get some blood on the floor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it struck me that one of the central bones between you two is how effective you think this state regulation is in having the market produce good outcomes. Um, I hope there's a more satisfying answer to this than just, say, dispositional optimism versus pessimism, or different readings of the empirics. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can expand, on, you can both expand on that a little bit. So what are you looking for exactly? So, because I think a lot of the uh, disagreements are going to turn on empirical facts about whether or not we think regulations are efficacious. Right. Um, I, so maybe to put it this way. Why is your reading of the empirics better? <laughs> um, you want to pass? I'll, I, can, I, have, I think I have something to say that I can, while you think. <laughs> I mean, I think it's case, it, it's case by case. But I think that's the, I, again, let's just take the United States. I think that the New Deal 
um, radically improved the lives of millions of American citizens and made their freedom, equality, and rights more than mere words for millions of Americans. And that in the absence of that, they were in the situation that many domestic workers are in the United States today, where they're totally under the thumb of their employers with no, um, you know, no real rights of exit, where they're um, invisible and marginalized and uh, have no rights to exercise. Actually, the domestic workers were excluded from New Deal legislation, so you can just look at the difference in the lives of those people. So I think there are a lot of important examples. I think the extension of the suffrage is another example where a social movement used the state to advance uh, the equality of citizens. I, but I, you know, it's not an unbroken record of good state intervention. The state has often intervened in the side on the side of the privileged. There is, so egalitarians think we should reform some of the access that people have to the state and some of the regulation of the state itself. That's part of what we together could do. Um, and so I'm, uh, I think I'm more optimistic about, uh, it's the Monty Python. I think there's more that the aqueducts and the roads are really important and the state did that. But I also think the potential for the state is greater. So, um, so the empirics are messy, right? And I think if we if we got into a debate about what exactly happened in the you know progressive era reforms, the New Deal, that, that that would be a little bit difficult to to make much traction with in the in the format that we've got available to us. But I think you know there are some theoretical reasons I think um, to have a kind of skeptical attitude towards the power of the state, and and it's those theoretical reasons that I was gesturing towards in my reference to um, the public choice literature, right? So um, I, I imagine many of you are, are familiar with some of the basic tenets of that literature, right? But the, uh, the underlying idea is that there's a kind of motivational homogeneity um, between market actors and political actors. And so just as we expect market actors to act in a re generally rationally self-interested way, so too we should expect political actors to act in a generally rationally um, self-interested way. Um, and what that means uh, for political actors is that they will often um, uh, put their own private interests as uh, as legislators or as um, as lobbyists or what have you over the common good, right? And so you get these these various classes of of problems emerging out of the literature. So you know one of the more kind of famous ones is this issue of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs, right? So if you have a social policy that imposes benefits on a relatively narrow uh, segment of the population, right, um, that population is, that segment of the population is going to expend a lot of uh, uh, financial and, and time resources uh, in fighting for the maintenance of, uh, of that legislation, whereas the broader community that bears the dispersed costs, right? I mean, you're all, uh, well, you're not in the United States, but I mean, if you're in the United States, right, you'd be paying a few pennies for the helium reserve, right? You'd be paying a few, uh, few dollars, maybe more than a few dollars for agricultural subsidies, but none of this stuff is really worth your time to get too excited about, and so you let it pass by, whereas any time agricultural subsidies come up on the chopping block in the United States Congress, right, everybody who benefits it knows about this well in advance and has their lobbyists on the hill willing to fight for it. The result of this, repeated over and over again numerous times, is that you get a bunch of different pieces of legislation, none of which promote the public good, but all of which benefit some tiny concentrated interest group. Um, and the cumulative effect, I think, is disastrous for society as a whole. Right? So that's a kind of theoretical reason to expect why you're going to get bad state policies um, given the uh, motivational assumptions and incentive structures that, um, that political actors face. Thank you. All right, I'd like to quickly take Quinn and Brian's questions, okay. and then we'll let our well, Yeah, well, we'll try and keep this quick, because I know everyone wants to go eat cheese, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, basically, um, this is a Tocqueville-centric question. Uh, there seem to me to be certain things um, that are necessary for, as Deborah said, you know, sort of de really de facto freedom and that these things are therefore necessary for uh, democratic society. And these things, you know, are, are 
Most importantly, uh, this one thing that Tocqueville talks about is self-interest properly understood. And for this to actually exist, you need things like freedom of association, modicum of education, um, you know, some leisure time. And for these things to actually exist, you need, I mean, this list is longer, but for these things to exist, you need some form of market regulation. So I'm wondering to what extent um, for this self-interest properly understood to really exist, because you know, for, certainly for the proletariat, we could not really say that self-interest properly understood actually is allowed to exist uh, for these people who are just, you know, they're working only to subsist. Um, so what, to what extent do you both think that perhaps uh, market regulation is actually necessary for democracy to exist properly? And then Brian. And then Brian. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you, you want me to hey, take a yeah. sequence? Yeah. Okay, um, this question's more de uh, directed towards Deborah, since um, you talk a lot about um, the importance of individuals being able to live out their conception of the good life. Um, and I want to point out a specific way in which markets may be antithetical to that, um, to that ideal, and that is that they, um, of course, to take advantage of comparative advantage, um, they incline towards specialization, which often leads to people being stuck in very monotonous, repetitive, sort of um, one side or um, single-minded jobs. And I think that um, them being stuck in those sort of jobs is, and the incentives the markets, um, uh, the, the incentives the market establishes for them to take those sort of jobs may be antithetical to um, their ability to live out um, their conception of the good life. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, pick, pick and choose. Say, say your last. I can only answer one of the two. Well, no, just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just thinking it's up to you. Okay, so on the markets are necessary, uh, market regulation necessary for democracy, yes, I think that <laughs> is uh, true. But I also think that market regulation is necessary for markets to function, so that there are background conditions to actually have markets. And one thing you need to have a market is the ability to exit. And you actually need to curtail monopoly. And if you don't have those things, if you, you know, one of the important things about a market is that nobody can influence the price on their own. That's it, right, one of the features of a market. No one individual can, can influence prices. But that's not true of monopolies. So you need a whole bunch of background circumstances in place. That's the, I think, what capitalism did, is it limited certain property rights to make markets function better. On the point about specialization, so actually one of the things I talk about in my book is that some kinds of markets actually shape people. So they're different, like an apple market, I eat apples, doesn't predict, well maybe it shapes me in some ways, certainly <laughs> cookie markets shape me in some ways. <laughs> but, um, but labor markets, childcare markets, are markets in which there's a feedback on the effects on the person. And this was something Adam Smith talked about. So Smith worried a lot about labor specialization. And so then the question is, if you notice that for people who do, the, you know, like in modern times with Charlie Chaplin, one task every day and nothing else, that it, they atrophy their other capacities, what ways do we have of trying to counteract that tendency? Sometimes we counteract it by job rotation. Sometimes we counteract it simply by the fact that if labor is really productive, people don't work 14-hour days, and we limit the uh, scope of the um, of the. Uh, working day, and then people can do other things outside the labor market, which many people who work in very specialized tasks do things outside, um, which develop other capacities. And we, of course, we also have a public education system. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, on, on the question of whether uh, markets, in some sense, presuppose uh, some form of uh, regulation, some form of, in, in particular, some form of state regulation. Um, I, I, I doubt that. I doubt that that's true either as a as a kind of logical matter, right? Like logically, they presuppose them, or as a as a historical claim, right? Like first came first came states, then came markets. Uh, I think that that both of those claims are dubious. Perhaps there's some form of regulation that's necessary for markets to exist, but as um, as I, I think I made clear in response to another question, I don't think that states are the only possible source of regulation. I think that social norms are often uh, an effective form of, of regulation and can provide many of the same kinds of goods that state regulation can. 
um, not not always better, but um, not always worse. Um, on the question of uh, of specialization, um, maybe right. I mean, it, 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 there may be. I'm op I'm open to this idea that um, specialization can have harmful effects. Right. That that not everything about markets is um, is rosy and 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 good. Um, so it could be that that one of the things that markets do is they encourage this kind of specialization and they in that way diminish people's ability to leave lead full and rich and, and meaningful lives. I do think that one perspective that one has to bring to bear on thinking about that kind of issue, or one, I guess, distinction that one has to bring to bear on thinking of that kind of issue, is the distinction between um, static and dynamic perspectives on the market. So I think that right, oftentimes, especially in academic philosophy, and thank, y y one of the things I love about your work is that it doesn't do this, but oftentimes when we think about markets, we think of them in, in purely static terms. right? We think of markets as just this, th this mechanism that divides up currently existing resources among currently existing people. So I think if you read the work of G.A. Cohen, which I have great respect for, but you get these desert island examples, right, where it's like A and B and they've got a bunch of coconuts and they're trying to figure out how to divide them up. Um, the market doesn't look very good in those static examples because I think one of the main virtues of markets is what they do in the long run, right, what they do in a more dynamic process, right? So markets don't just allocate up existing goods. Markets produce incentives for the creation of, of new goods. And so even if at a given point in time, Markets may operate in a way um, so as to as to sort of um, promote this this um, objectionable form of specialization. I think that over time, right, if you look at, at what markets have done in um, in most of the market societies that we're familiar with, it, it's hard to argue that markets haven't right um, opened up a, a, a way out of that. Right, like you know, I I brew my own beer at home, right, and that's ridiculously economically inefficient. Right, like it would be much, <laughs> much more efficient just for me to go to the store and buy something from Budweiser because they're a lot better at making beer than I am. Um, but I, I can afford to do that, right? <laughs> like I can afford to. <laughs> they're, they're, they don't make good beer, but they're really good at making not good beer, right? So g give them props. Um, I can afford to do that though because because of the wealth that market societies have generated. All right. So so in a, from a more dynamic perspective, I think the the issue of specialization kind of takes on a different. Uh, a cast. On the note of beer, I'll, I'll note that when we adjourn, I'm going to invite everyone to join us for a reception in the adjoining room. Um, this is, as I said, the first time that we've had a two-person exchange in one of these settings. And one of the concerns that academics sometimes have about multi-person exchanges is that instead of developing out an idea at some substantial length, one will get uh, glibness and quickness and shallowness. Um, I chose carefully in who it was I invited to sit in these chairs, and I'm delighted at how substantive and thorough the ideas were that were able to be developed, and how substantive the conversation was about areas of agreement and disagreement. Uh, I would like to Thank the RGCS student fellows who have been the recurring core of the audience for the lecture series and to congratulate and say farewell to those of you who are graduating. This is the last event of your year and the fellowship draws to a close. And I hope that you will join me in thanking Professors Satz and Zulinski.